I, I have one of the best jobs in the world because it allows me to have my curiosity on a daily basis. But I get to work with amazing humans in the data science practice, some of the best market researchers I've ever seen, business analysts that just really can get to the heart of the problem. Our, our focus is really on two core areas within the business. Strategic decisions, how do we make the business have better insights to drive decisions and really get that decision science baked into everything we do. But also customer insights. Now we're starting to see a slow change where we are the rate limiters for the power of artificial intelligence. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Sam Knowles. And joining us today is Mark Montgomery, Vice President and International Head of Integrated Insights at Novartis, a role he's held for the past three years. Mark, Mark has a rich and varied career in pharma, having served as the Global Head of Commercial Analytics and Insights at GSK before joining Novartis, following a seven-year spell at AstraZeneca in digital, data, and strategic planning. And before working in pharma, intriguingly, and we'll come back to this, Mark spent a decade in creative content strategy and brand management in three different agencies. Mark holds a bachelor's in marketing and an MBA in organizational leadership from the Southern New Hampshire University. Indeed, his resume more than hints at a love of lifelong learning, with recent qualifications in AI and behavioral economics from Yale School of Management, the Chicago Booth School of Business, and Kellogg Executive Education. He's also been a guest lecturer at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania for the past decade. Mark, first of all, welcome to Data Malarkey. Well, thank you, Sam, for having me. As a fan of your podcast, it's an honor to be here. Well, it's it's terrific to have fans. Uh, it's great to hear. And, and, and I know from our conversation before that you've had a, a wide-ranging listen to previous guests. But before we talk about data and insight, I'd like to ask a question that's designed to get to the very heart of you. And as you'll know, it doesn't necessarily ask us ask you to tell us about your work. So first of all, Mark, can you tell me, how do you spend your time? Well, I spend as much time as possible with friends and family, um, and I find it's a good way to remain grounded in who I actually am at the core versus the employee I am during the day. Um, whenever I get a free chance, my wife and I love exploring, so we travel as much as possible to break away from what we see day in and day out and just explore this beautiful world we live in. Um, I'm also a huge fan of health, both physical, mental health. So you'll find me a couple of days of, at the week, a couple of days a week at either the gym or out for a long run, or sometimes even doing crazy poses at a yoga studio with all the goal of restoring and rebuilding uh, from the day-to-day -day grind that we all live. But as you alluded to earlier, I'm also a lifetime learner and it's a big part of my time. Uh, I'm a curious person by nature. So I'm always putting my head into something new and trying to identify new ways of thinking, new ways of looking at things and just constantly learning. Currently, I'm doing some studies in human behaviors and decisions and how we're all evolving with the new technology that's coming out after us and the knowledge we have at our forefront every day. That's terrific. Um, as a, I, 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 When people describe themselves as curious, I know that I've got an insights person on my hands. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your role at Novartis as Global Head of Integrated Insights, the, the purpose of the function, the type of work that you do, and the teams that you lead? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I have one of the best jobs in the world because it allows me to have my curiosity on a daily basis. But I get to work with amazing humans in the data science practice, some of the best market researchers I've ever seen, business analysts that just really can get to the heart of the problem, and then behavior science on top of it. So I'm lucky enough to lead this integrated insights organization and work with some top talent in the industry. And that, that's a blessing every day. Our, our focus is really on two core areas within the business, strategic decisions. How do we make the business have better insights to drive decisions and really get that decision science baked into everything we do. But also customer insights. How do we understand the blockers, the needs, the barriers, what goes on in our customers every day and unlock the potential in a market or in an area to really help patients live longer and accelerate care with them. It's a great honor to live, work on this team. It's a great honor to lead this team. And we're just never short of curious topics to dive into. I'm fascinated to hear the the, the range of, of um, those that you lead from data science to market research through business uh, an analytics. 
What do you believe is the best way of bringing together multiple data sources that often come from radically different domains and in very different formats and join the dots and, and get to insight? Yeah, Sam, this is what I'm really passionate about. It, it, it starts with defining what an insight is for me. And to break it down, I, I use very simple uh, approach to insight. It's an accurate meaning, intuitive understanding of a person or thing that compels action or either explains action. So there has to be like, what is the meaningful intuitive understanding, the aha moment that really drive you to want to do something or explains why something actually occurred. If done correctly, an insight is all about the what, why, and what to do in a very compelling way that you just know it's the right thing to do and move forward in the business. And being in, involved in integrated insights, it's about stitching all that information together. You know, insights is a discipline and a process. And for us in Novartis and my team, it really starts with what is the business question we're trying to solve? But it goes beyond that because there's surface questions. And as an insights professional, the curiosity kicks in. I really want to get to the problem behind the problem and a very basic five why strategy in questioning to get, really understand the real question or business problem we need to solve. From there, what, what I like to start doing is going, what do I already know? And this involves a heavy amount of desktop research, framing up hypotheses, and quickly putting an academic rigor into everything you do. Can you bring can you bring a hypothesis alive to go to the next level, or can you shoot it down with the knowledge that you already have in house? The third step in the process that we look at when we're integrating insights is really what data do we have to support our hypothesis, to validate it, or answer the next level questions, remaining in the data world, building off of the knowledge we already have. And then if you still can't answer the question, it's great. Go into market research. Let's talk to people. There's a human element to what we do in shaping insights. And it's really understanding people and looking at what the needs are. The data takes us so far. The desktop takes us so far. But then we can triangulate that with research. That all starts coming together. And then it gets a little bit more complicated because you might get that aha moment in one piece of research or one integrated insight. And then you have to understand how that ripple affects through all aspects of the business. Everything is connected in insights by a right thread, often not seen. And as an insight professional, it's not enough just to serve up that aha moment, it's to understand the impact of it to the business across all parts of it. I absolutely love your your very, very clear, uh, and I'm sure you both drill this into into your teams, but also have it fed back too, but this meaningful, intuitive understanding. And I, I think that's a wonderful, wonderful uh, definition. I'm also a big fan, like you, of... Um, of the uh, of the root cause analysis of the five whys of really just asking you know from pr personal introspection about you know why am I behaving in this way to uh, to pr to proper business understandings um, uh, and uh, I'm also very very pleased to hear that you're a big fan of supporting and testing hypotheses with data a proper popperian and not 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 looking to prove hypotheses but supporting and testing them now listen i mentioned before that you before you started working in pharma i know you've been you've been in, in that in the, the sector for for many many years but you spent maybe up to a decade in creative agencies i'm interested to know what you bring from your time spent working in creative agencies to the world of pharma because it's not necessarily the the the, the most um well, what one finds on on the CVs of many people working in your sector. Yeah, it, it, it's a kind of an odd mix of art and science coming together, often in my head, Sam. Um, but I, I find it a, a good mix. And good creative is no different than good insights. Um, you know, when, when I look at what creative can do and solid creative, is like being hit so upside the head with a, with a brick. And you stop immediately and you think and you resonate what that means to me. And often when you see a great piece of creative, you're not sure why it made you stop in your tracks, but it made you stop and it made you think deeper. That's incredibly powerful. 
That's incredibly powerful. And there's a lot of people out there that have amazing gifts and creativity that can really pause and get people to think differently. And it's such a talent that's underrated in everything we do. And when I found in the creative world, it was a great place to explore the boundaries of thinking and really understand what resonates with humans, our customers at the end of the day. And it gave me a deep foundation understanding of individuals and how they think, what their motivations are, and what actually stops them. And I've been able to leverage that approach and strategy and insights to really kind of pause and go, how do we bring things together to make it better and really understand the problem behind the problem? The, the beauty of good creative, it's good creative is very collaborative. You have copywriters, you have production artists, you have the visual designers, you have the strategists who pull it off and it really becomes a team sport. Insights is no different. It's also a team sport. We all have, we all look at things slightly different. And same with creative, pulling people together to look at insight, to look at creative and work together is incredibly powerful. So I took that with me. Look at problems different, work in a collaborative mindset, and focus on the customer. What really will resonate with that has been a, a continuity across my career the whole time. What comes up in insight has to execute in the market. And that's a real, real big difference that carried over throughout my career. Makes makes absolute, absolute perfect sense. I'm I'm so uh, encouraged to hear you talk about uh, the human motivations and behavior. You know, as the American business writer Dan Pink um, says in his book, uh, to sell is human. We're all in the moving business, the persuading business. But that moving and persuading business, we can't get there without this proper understanding of the audiences that we're looking to to take on the journey with us. Tell me, I I think I'm right in saying that you're quite a fan of, of uh, the Stanford D School at AO design thinking uh, way of working. Um, can you tell me why you believe that's such a useful approach for, some, for someone who works in the insights business? Yeah, uh, design thinking is really one of the most powerful ways to unlock the potential of a team to really interact with design principles and deliver value to the customer and the shareholders of the business. And, and the great part with design thinking and what really got me exposed to it is the, the power to unlock a collaborative approach. And that collaborative approach begins with a beginner mind. It's very interesting when you study, when you study children, and anybody who's had has children or has had children grow up in their household, they know when they're very young, everything's why, why, why? Why is the sky blue? Why is your yard green? Why is that leaf brown? Children ask questions constantly, and then they want to know why when you answer. As a parent, it drove me absolutely crazy that my children were asking me all this, but they were embracing their curiosity. And by the time we turn about seven and we get into the structure of school and the whole nine yards that go along with that, we lose that ability to ask the why. We're afraid to ask it. Design thinking is all about starting with empathy of the customer and asking the why they're going through this. What are they experiencing? Why is this important to them? What are they trying to do? And it takes you out of it and gives you a beginner's mind like a child to really get to the root problem a customer or business is trying to solve. And it's those fresh eyes, that empathy followed by the lies, that is the power of design thinking. I, I often, when, I, when I'm running uh, training in uh, in insight and insightful thinking, I often say, you know, insight and empathy, they're not the same thing, but you draw a Venn diagram, there's going to be a huge shade between them. And your, your mention of beginner's mind um, takes me back to my first bit of uh, education as as uh, I, you know, you can take the classics out of the out of the man, but you can't take if you take the man out of classics, you can't take classics out of the man. As regular listeners will know, before I retrained as a psychologist, I was a classicist, um, and I think in crafting really smart questions for research and looking to for the right data to surface the, these relevant insights, I've always been inspired by the words of Socrates. I mean, Socrates didn't write a thing, but the Socratic paradox that all that I know is that I know nothing. 
parking our assumptions, our biases, our prior knowledge and prejudices at the door, you know, we have a much better chance of getting to insight. How do you believe that uh, inside and analytics professionals can best avoid internal biases and test, as you say, rather than seek to prove their hypotheses? Yeah, it, it, so that is such a great question and a very tough one and a very tough one because we all grow up in our careers wanting to be smart. We all want to have the answer. We all want to show up bigger than everybody else. That is how we're wired as individuals and our careers get rewarded for that. But in insights, we have a responsibility to be the central point of truth and really shape the narrative of where an organization is going and how to maximize an organization potential. That, that comes with a certain level of responsibility that you don't normally see in an organization construct. With that, we owe it to ourselves to leave our biases in the editor. Our job is to be curious and be that internal scientist proving ourselves wrong or that academic and really proving ourselves wrong. That's why it's so important in insights to work in a collaborative mindset because if you sit and look and stare at data long enough by yourself or stare at a research project and start building the story yourself, you're going to have such biases going on that your final result will be as good. But if you partner up with two or three people and you read the business as a group and put that rigor in and try to prove yourself wrong along that journey, you really can make the right decisions that are guiding a business in the right direction. And that's incredibly powerful. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, completely, completely aligned with you. What do you, I, I know that, that we, we've talked about kind of moving from data to insight. One of the things that I'm really interested um, is how some organizations, culturally, some individuals, some teams can stumble when it gets, we, we, you know, we, we, we get the, we get the, we get the, um, the profound and useful understanding, uh, as I would call it, or the, you know, the meaningful, intuitive understanding, as, 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 as you put it so eloquently. What do you think um, is the best way of getting individuals, teams, whole organizations to move from insight to action? This is one of my favorite topics at all because it's really about insight to action. It's how do we shape insight that you can execute on? It is at the root of what we need to do as insight professionals. It actually goes back one step, Sam, in my thoughts. It's really what is an insight versus a data point? And we need to upskill individuals and teams and organizations to move past data points and move to insights. Because often we can move off of the wrong data point in the wrong direction, which is not an insight. And so getting to the point where we're truly communicating what insights are and aligning teams on what they are and what they're not is the first step in that journey. The second step for me comes down to one simple thing. What is the answer we're trying to solve? And when, once you get to that questioning point of view or the business pro problem you're trying to solve, it becomes very powerful of why do you want this information would be the additional question. How are you going to change the business with this information? What will this do for our customers? And is this even a priority? You know, in the insight business, we have a backlog of things to solve constantly. Is this a priority now? And if I do solve it, what are you going to do with it? How, how are we going to move on? And it's just the right use of our time. So answering those questions, even before you move into analysis, even before you stand up a study is so important. And that sets you up for action because you already had the conversation before you put any investment in. And then understanding that this is a process. And as you go through shaping your insights, you focus on what's meaningful and measurable. You need to understand that two goes to hand in hand. It could be meaningful, but if I can't measure a change on the back end, is it worth moving on? And those two go hand in hand. And as I said before, collaboration is key. It is a team sport, and you do have a ripple effect as you read the business together. And if you, if you get used to this team sport, uh, you know, it's like rugby. Everybody's playing different parts of the field, but you all have to come together for the scrub read the business as a scrum, that will inspire action. 
of others. And that's a very powerful. The final thing, you know, going back to our design thinking conversation, that's really a great way to bring insights to action. I've used that quite a lot in my career to inspire go-to-market strategy, business strategy, product development, and marketing capabilities as well as creative. It's a great way to stitch it all together in a collaborative way that's breaking down the normal barrier, barriers in an organization and bringing that designer's mind to everything we do. So those are a couple of the steps that I, I like to apply for insight section. Like, like very much. I, I, I particularly like your 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 rugby analogy. I'm I'm often struck. I mean, I know in the in I, I'm not sure if you're a fan or not, but in in now I was watching quite a lot of the World Cup that took place in France recently, um, and I, I, I suppose the, the the modern backs are much more kind of physically like the forwards. They're much more pumped up, much more beat. But 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 one of the things that I I I, I, I haven't played rugby for many many years. I was no good at it. But one of the things I was always I'm always struck by is how perfect it is. Um, at one the, one, the collaborative piece, but two, really anybody of any physical shape or size has a role to play. It's a really kind of inc- it's a really inclusive game uh, for, for men and women. So I think it's I think it's a lovely analogy. Let's uh, let's shift gear a little bit. I, I mentioned earlier on you've recently got you've recently um, uh, been studying AI, um, and I wonder if you feel excited or threatened or, or or nervous or maybe all of those about the, the 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 sudden emergence of powerful tools i mean obviously in the generative side but actually actually more broadly we seem to have reached an, an important moment how does that make you feel well i'm on the excited camp of ai i i, I personally witnessed like many of us do uh, being a being a self-described nerd in this space um, I acknowledge that AI is everywhere, and I was able last winter, standing on the beach in Florida, watch SpaceX launch one of the rockets, and it was such an amazing thing to watch this AI-driven rocket take off, and then big bangs, and you know, just the flume of smoke coming up behind it was mind-blowing that humans are actually able to set a rocket up like that. But the most impressive part of that visual was after the smoke cleared is watching the rockets return back to the launch pad and land straight up on their own all driven by ai that blew my mind it's one thing to send it up it's another thing to have it land before yep that is the power of ai in our lives already i have a car that is ai driven and i drove it last night on full autopilot and it parked itself, and it just is part of my life. We all interact with Siri or Alexa or whoever we have in our ecosystem of our phone. So AI is everywhere, and we just need to realize it's not a scary thing. It's actually here to help. The rate limiter it, nowadays with the you know, chat GPT that's really taking over now, fours and fives coming out right behind it, is we're starting to see a switch from computing power was our rate limiter. How could we get more cloud space? How could we write better self-learning algorithms? How could we train models better? Now, we're starting to see a slow change where we are the rate limiters for the power of artificial intelligence. And how do we ask better questions? How do we get our data better organized? How do we drive this thing to provide even more meaningful value than what it already can do and what it already does. So we're at a very interesting inflection point where we're seeing a shift where the computing power was our rate limiters. Now we have become the rate limiters of what we can do with that computing power. That's that's a that's a wonderful wonderful uh, way of looking at it. Um, and I and I'm not of course asking you to reveal any kind of trade secrets, but as a uh, as a leader of global integrated insights uh, in one of the world's biggest pharma businesses. Um, can you give us a hint about what Novartis is, do, is doing to harness the power of AI to drive insightful thinking? I can. Broadly across the, org- the not our organization, the industry as a whole, you're seeing AI pop up in clinical trials and looking at data different, processing the data quicker. Um, that's a huge change. The other exciting part that you're seeing you know, in, in life sciences and healthcare at all is science itself from the computing power changes 
is advancing so quickly. There's one statistic I saw a couple of days ago that by 2030, science will double every seven years. So our knowledge of science will be completely different in seven years from what it is today. That is mind blowing. It used to be 50, you know, 50 years, 25, 50 years between changes in science and scientific approach. It's now looking at doubling and that's all because of computing power. What does that mean for patients or doctors that personalized medicine is only going to change and become part of all of our lives? We all are slightly different as humans and that requires us to have personalized care. So you're starting to see that pop up more and more. And then in the insights world in general, what we're seeing is asking questions of the knowledge you already have in house. We've seen that in pharma and out of pharma as well. The new way of looking at insights and data is to ask questions of it and not as much analysts as you did before, which requires us to rethink how we ask questions and how to be more clear, more strategic about our questions. How do we put strategic curiosity in people to go deeper into the data at a faster rate than we ever did before? It's a great opportunity, not just for pharma, but for everyone. Very, very interesting. Um if we'd have been having this conversation, well, we probably wouldn't have been having this conversation, certainly not via this medium, um, but kind of 10 years ago. But if we were, if we were, if we had been, if we'd met and talked 10 years ago, um, we might have talked all about big data. Um, do you believe that big data is necessarily better data? Do you think we've kind of, do you think that the power of AI has kind of, has almost sort of rendered the, the concept of big data meaning us. I'm just in, in, interested what you feel about that. Yeah, in, interesting question, Sam. Very interesting. Ten years ago, we probably would have sat around and talked over a pint or a cup of coffee about the power of big data, how it's going to change our own life. Um, it was kind of the buzz there for quite a few years. I'm not a big fan of big data. I do not think big data is better, better data. I actually see the term big data as a distraction to most organizations as a whole. Um, I'm, I'm of the camp nowadays, you know, a little more mature in my career. I've been down the path a couple of times here. Most organizations struggle to manage and leverage basic data sets in a consistent way. Uh, managing data is hard. Getting data organized, keeping it organized, breaking down silos, setting up ecosystems, all expensive and hard to do. Uh, so how do we get excited about the basics? and really learn to leverage them before we jump into the shiny objects of big data, where I like to call jump into the big data swamps that never really bring their value. So that's a tough one. And, and once an organization becomes brilliant at the basics and leveraging the data that they have in hand, then we should really consider what is the next best use case to build off of our infrastructure. Having big data doesn't mean you need to use it. You need to focus on the use cases that bring value. You truly understand the feasibility of that use case, but then you're also looking at the total cost of ownership of that use case over a life cycle of that development of the new product or capability within the organization. Switching topic, uh, I mean, it's all connected, but switching topic a little bit. Um, I don't think there's anybody in any organization that ever says these days we don't have enough data. They often say they don't have, we don't have enough insight, and you've been very eloquent about the, about the tools and techniques uh, and approaches that you and your teams take to, to move from data to insight. But thinking about the, the, the fact that, that data is so important in communication and in storytelling, in your mind, what is the best way to combine narrative and numbers to, to, to tell stories with more impact? Yeah, the, the art and science of data translation. And it is, it is a little bit of art and science. Also an area I see quite often where insight professionals trip. We get so wrapped up in the details of what we're doing. We get hung up on the data. We get hung up on a, you know, a research project coming through. We forget that our job is to connect data to the business, translate that in a story. For me, it breaks down into the narrative that you need to resonate with your audience. And if you look at what a good nonfiction book is, a good nonfiction book is all about information that is factual and true to that individual or that storyline. But you don't put it down. It's very compelling. It keeps you going. 
It's the art of telling a story around facts that is often missed. And if you lead with empathy and you really connect with your internal customer early on in your analysis, you really start connecting with knowledge. And if you script it right, just like a good nonfiction book, you'll start looking at how to inspire people and staying true to the root business question you're trying to answer. It's not an easy one to teach, and it's not an easy one to master. But there is, I'm very fortunate to work with a group um, that is incredibly good at it. Um, but they put a lot of work into shaping that story. And visualization goes a long way. You know, most of us are visual leaders. We look at things, we can assume, we can absorb visuals much more faster. So how do we share a story in visualization faster than we can in a big slide deck. We always need to pressure test ourselves. Can you read this in two minutes and really get the, not the root cause of it? That's a good story. If it takes me longer than that, it's probably not a good story. I, I think that's a very, very fair yardstick. Um, what's the worst example or the most glaring example of a misuse of data that you've ever observed, either in your career or, or maybe more broadly in the public domain? Yeah, that, that's a big pet peeve of mine. Um, Data is often used without context. And I see it everywhere from the media to I see it in corporate meetings. Again, data is just a data. Without context, it's not an insight. So if you throw up a statistical number, which you see, we all see quite often, what does that really mean? You know, statistics, you know, there, there's, you need to have the context connected to it. And we often don't see that. And often we become immune from challenging that too. So that, that's a big pet peeve of me I see everywhere. The other one I see, I've seen a couple times in my career is big data infrastructure that's been built around false positives. And you, I ran into this a, a few times in my career when one or two people go off and do this skunk works and come back and say, you know, basically we solved all the problems in the world. Now give us, you know, a million pounds. We're going to productize this and scale it. But because it was done in an incubator, it's loaded with false positives. And it just becomes a big drain on the organization chasing these false positives. But more importantly, it loses credibility of insights and data in an organization. So false positives is a big challenge we as insight professional have to stay aware of, but also data without context is really the heart of what we're trying to get through and solve for constantly. Very good. Very good. I'm very, very much approve of both of those. Um, a, a Columbo question for you. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about uh, data or insights or uh, the way you move from one to the other? Uh, that I should have done? Well, I think we covered quite a lot here, Sam. Um, I can geek out with about this for days on end. I, I think we could really have some banter around a couple different topics. Yeah, but we covered most of it. You know, we're in this exciting time with data. The power of what we can do around data and how it can influence all of our life is absolutely amazing. And it, it's a great time to be a practitioner in this space. With the risk, we still have to focus on how do we humanize everything that we do, either from a tool development or from an insights point of view, that we connect as individuals with the products, or service, or knowledge that comes out of the data. So exciting time, but we have to remember to remain grounded as we go through. Very good. Now, listen, uh, as a final question, where can our listeners and indeed our viewers find out more about you and what Navas is doing online. Well, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, it's under Mark Montgomery at LinkedIn. Feel free to ping me there or link in with me. That's pretty much where I spend my, some, some of my time just following some good leaders around the world with different careers. So that's the best channel to get a hold of me, Sam. Thank you so much for giving of your time today for telling us your approaches to moving from uh, data to insight and insight to action. I think it's fair to say that if there were only more people like you working in uh, in business generally and in pharma specifically, there would be rather less data malarkey in moving from one to the other and rather more data-driven common sense. Mark Montgomery, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Sam. Great conversation. Thanks so much for listening to Data Malarkey. 
the podcast about using data smarter. To find out what kind of data storyteller you are, why not take our data storytelling scorecard? It takes just two minutes to complete and we'll give you a personalized report right away. Visit data-storytelling.scoreapp.com or follow the link in the show notes.